In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to Trinity Sunday. That Sunday, when preachers worldwide struggle to explain a doctrine just barely suggested in the New Testament in such a way that they are hauled before an ecclesiastical court to face charges of heresy. Fortunately for me, the Episcopal Church rarely charges anyone with heresy. Messing with the rubrics is another question. With that blessed assurance in mind, I think today I'll throw caution to the wind and focus on Nicodemus. Nicodemus is one of those characters of the Bible who is both significant and about whom we know very little. Like Lazarus, he is only found in John's Gospel. There are no references to him outside the biblical material, and the one name that appears in Jewish records from the first century that is even vaguely close misses the mark by about 40 years. All we know is what the evangelist tells us. He was a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. According to John, Jesus calls him a teacher of Israel. Anything else we know about Nicodemus, we glean through inference from the three times he appears in John's gospel. The first, of course, is the story we just heard. But before we delve into that, I think it's helpful to remember what has gone on in John's gospel just before Nicodemus's nighttime encounter with Jesus. The account we just heard is from the third chapter of John's gospel. Chapter one, you'll recall, has the great prologue about the pre-existent word becoming flesh. Chapter one contains the story of John the Baptist pointing his disciples in Jesus's direction. It contains the accounts of Jesus's calling of his first apostles. Chapter two begins with the story of the wedding in Cana and Jesus turning the water into wine. Following that, and after a brief sojourn back home in Capernaum, Jesus decides to go to Jerusalem for a festival. And there, he chases the money changers and animal sellers out of the temple. And then we have chapter three, with the Pharisee Nicodemus, a Jewish leader, coming to Jesus at night and identifying Jesus as a teacher who has come from God, who clearly is empowered by God to do miraculous signs. What the evangelist doesn't make clear at all, and what we then have to guess, is precisely what it was that drew Nicodemus to Jesus. He doesn't even ask Jesus an opening question. And the fact that he visited Jesus at night would suggest that his quest was personal, definitely not sanctioned by other Pharisees or leaders. And there is little in his brief interaction with Jesus that even indicates that Jesus's discourse about being born from above or born again had much impact on Nicodemus other than confusing him. How are these things possible? He asks. But something must have happened with Nicodemus. We just don't know what. But we know that something happened because a few chapters later in John, he appears again. But his re-entry into the gospel occurs after Jesus feeds 5,000, teaches about the bread of life, and goes to Jerusalem again, knowing that it's dangerous. I mean, there is a lot of controversy about this itinerant teacher. Some folks think he's a messiah, others just a, a significant prophet, and some want to arrest him. The Pharisees dismissed Jesus as a country bumpkin who is good at deceiving other country bumpkins. But Nicodemus, who, as John reminds us, had come to Jesus earlier, points out 
our law doesn't judge someone without first hearing him and learning what he's doing, does it? His Pharisaic colleagues retort by lumping him in with the easily duped country bumpkins. Maybe there is something to being from the sticks. But whatever it was, it had claimed Nicodemus. God seems to have been working in at least this Pharisee to the point where he appears to indicate that he hoped that Jesus' teaching career wouldn't be put to a premature end. We have little idea what happens to Nicodemus after his being rebuked by the other Pharisees, because he doesn't appear again in John's Gospel until after Jesus' crucifixion. Then he teams up with another well-placed Jew, Joseph of Arimathea, described by the evangelist as a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because he feared the Jewish authorities. And about Nicodemus, John reminds us that he was the one who at first had come to Jesus at night. The two of them, in red, had come, uh, the two of them pooled their resources and influence. Joseph's access to Pilate and his garden tomb, and Nicodemus's 75 pounds of burial spices to bury Jesus. What a turn of events. Nicodemus, who first comes to Jesus at night, at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry. Nicodemus, who is absolutely baffled by the play on words, being born from above or born again. Nicodemus, who is willing to stand up to his colleagues to demand a fair investigation of Jesus's teachings. This same Nicodemus, over the course of a number of months, was willing to contribute out of his wealth enough to ensure that that enigmatic teacher executed as a criminal was given a proper burial. As the wonderful hymn by 18th century William Cowper puts it, God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. It's no wonder then that in the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions, Nicodemus is considered a saint, an exemplar of the faith. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. A great mystery describes the Trinity, like many other doctrines of the church. And mystery is what I hope I've suggested, is suffused throughout the story of Nicodemus. And I would assert is suffused throughout the stories of our lives with God. To me, what is foundational to the mystery of the Trinity is the idea that God becomes known to us in a vast number of ways. A vast number we've reduced to three. Christians, for centuries have labored to keep the three separate but related. The Athanasian Creed is a very labored example of this reduced to this picture. I know that in the fourth and fifth century Constantinople, people literally fought over definitions of the Trinity. But I know too that what really interests us is a way of talking about our experiences of God experiences that are varied. Varied, of course, between different individuals, but varied also in our own individual experiences. Something gripped Nicodemus. Something he had heard, perhaps, about the changing of the water into wine at Cana. Maybe he had been in the temple when Jesus threw out the money changers and dove sellers. And Jesus' actions triggered in him some longing for a fulfillment of scripture that he hadn't seen. Perhaps he had stood in awe of the work of the creator, the heavens at night, and recognized the darkness and hoped for light in his own person. And he came to Jesus seeking that light. We don't know. But we can guess that 
in some way, God came to Nicodemus, which led him to a personal encounter with Jesus. And something in that unique personal relationship started a work in him, a work of the Spirit that enabled him to stand up to his colleagues, a work of the Spirit that moved him tenderly to care for the teacher at that teacher's end. Where or how do we encounter God? Is it in the wonders of creation, as the psalmist writes, when I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place? What are human beings that you think about them? What are we human beings that you pay attention to them? Is it a groaning too deep for words where we require the Spirit's assistance? as Paul writes to the Romans. Is it a personal relationship with Jesus, our brother, our friend? Is it all of these, sometimes differently, sometimes together? This, to me, my brothers and sisters, is the mystery that is the Trinity. God meets us in our questions. God did with Nicodemus, driving him in the night to go see Jesus. That personal relationship stews within us the work of the Spirit. That enriches our wonder of stars, rivers, birds. And we share those experiences anew and again with the only one who might understand our brother, Jesus. There is no separation. There is no hierarchy. There is no time constraint. God doesn't appear in one way to the Old Testament folks, another way to Jesus' apostles, and another way to the church. God appears in all those ways to all of us all the time. The doctrine of the Trinity, laid out centuries ago, endeavored to speak of that mystery of God's presence in our lives. A presence that would not be confined to one kind of relationship, creator, lawgiver, teacher, friend, savior, inner voice. It's a presence that works in all of those ways. The doctrine of the Trinity then is one that ultimately affirms God love, God's love for us wherever and whenever we are able to accept it. It is a doctrine that invites us into the divine dance, an interweaving dance known in antiquity as the perichoresis that captivated Nicodemus to the point that over time he joined in. It's a dance to which we are invited as well. Amen.